This is the Tabernacle Podcast with Matt Stevens, Adam Ray, and me, John Vermilia. What's up, fellas? Hi, buddy. How are you? <laughs> I feel like I haven't seen you at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every day this week. I haven't seen you enough, Matt. Not enough, but yeah. You know. What, what, uh, I appreciate you taking time off yeah. from your job to My be pleasure. here. pleasure. Yeah. I mean, you got like. I'm retired. retired ah, uh, you're retired. Yeah. <laughs> I can do this. Retired, but really retired though? Cause it seems like you're still working. There's there. always plenty to do, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Well, there's a, a little problem I overheard you saying about a, about a motor, about a boat motor. Right. If my motor was running and on my boat at the moment, I might not be here, but. You know, you would be on the Manistee. Oh, uh, I like to be on the Manistee. Yeah, no, that's it's it, legendary how much you like to be on the Manistee. It is sometimes to excess, but <laughs> is it true that you have taken a board Zoom call in a deer stand? That is true. It maybe even outside the stand, sitting in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, and those weren't those weren't exactly pleasant ones. It no, seems, they weren't. But we won't go there. <laughs> we're not we won't go, go there. there. But we yes, have a it's crisis. <laughs> we have a crisis. We call a Zoom board meeting. He's dialing in from the Upper Peninsula. Perfect. Dean's place. Yeah, and you've been in those places where there's uh-huh. not good cell service. No, at all. In a box. In a box. Watching deer. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And, and you, sir, you were on the last podcast. I was. Are you just and well? Have we scared you enough yet? In the time? I am loving every day. <laughs> is that a true statement? I, it is. Really? Yeah. Because I feel like we just said, here's a whole lot of John's dysfunction. <laughs> Have fun. It's, it's um, given me just like a ton of joy to see the pieces mm. and be like, oh. I, I can fix this, you know, like I, I know what we need to do. I'm so this. happy. Yeah. That makes me so happy. <laughs> New jobs. So, fix this. Yeah. New jobs are um, great. I love, uh, love the people. Um, I've enjoyed, you know, one by one working to get to know them. And, um, you know, you can ask my wife, like she says, uh, last night, even when I came home, she's like, um, you do realize that you're happy every day. Right. And I'm like, like, yeah, I guess I am. You, know? <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> you got a new project. Uh, yeah. So, so if uh, you haven't been around or you haven't um, been caught up or you don't get our emails because you haven't filled out a card or, you know, registered online to get in the database, Adam Ray's our uh, executive pastor now here at the tab. Um, for those that don't know, we don't throw a lot of titles. This is going to make you really mad, Matt, uh, but you won't tell me. Uh, Matt, Matt's on our board. He's the chairman of our board. And just really admire both both of you guys for your love for Jesus, your love for people, your love for his church, your service to the church. And and I'm not just talking ours. You've, you've been in ministry 24 years. But I admire both of you um, because you're among a, a list that I have of when I'm stuck as an amateur outdoorsman, I look up to you both, whether it's hunting. If it's fishing, I don't even go anymore unless I'm going with you. It's just that, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's other guys, but... I've, we've never failed to hammer them no. out on the Manistee River. You know, Matt is a prolific fisherman and hunter and um, Adam the same. And so what we thought we'd do with this podcast is uh, I want to hear some hunting stories because from both of you, I know God has used the outdoors profoundly in your journey. And, and, and I, you know, I struggled whether to, to uh, couch the conversation or begin the conversation in this way. But um, it's easy if you grew up in the churches that I grew up in and that you grew up in and maybe Adam as well to kind of see this as some sort of a distraction or it's a less than or it's, it's, you know, as a young boy in church where they're using flannel graphs. Did you have the flannel graph oh, where absolutely. they're telling stories? Yeah. You know, where the same guy plays Peter, and then the next day he's Zacchaeus, and he's always facing one way, and they just kind of change the accessories. When in 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 my flannel board childhood experience, it's I just wanted to be outside, you know, and maybe it was to play sports or to do this or to do that, but I would much rather Sunday school class that involved camouflage and firearms, you know. So maybe that was wrong of me, but I kind of picked up on that that was that wasn't important. That wasn't important to God. And so similar experience or not at all? Yeah, absolutely similar experience. I think even, you know, the 
consistency of my passion for the outdoors um, as a, pull my headphones out here, <laughs> um, as a, a young man being involved in that at a very early age, um, it wasn't something that I would sit there and be like, if someone brought it up, oh yeah, let's mm -hmm. do that. It was from the second that I was awake in the morning, I'm thinking about that opportunity to be outdoors. And so, you know, you have all these other things that you got to get done. You got to get your schoolwork done. You got to do your practices. You got to do these things. But then getting into a space where you're uh, literally able to just feast on what God's created for us in the outdoors. Like that was my passion. Riding a bike down to the river, riding a bike to the ponds, um, and trying to figure out a lot of things on my own. Even uh, dad introduced me to the small game world and the pan fishing world early. And then it just kind of took off from there. But for sure, you know, the, um, I think the reason that I don't play instruments proficiently is because of the outdoors. <laughs> like I just couldn't stand Piano being, or BB gun. Yeah, exactly. I'm out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Matt, so. Matt, was that similar for you? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've really never spent a lot of time thinking about it, but certainly from the first time that I went squirrel hunting, that dad took, took, took me out squirrel hunting, it was just a. It's been a passion, and I think that's that's how God wired wired me up. Yeah, you know, most of my life I didn't I didn't uh, acknowledge it or use it for for His glory, but uh, I've thought about it a lot later in life, and, right? And and now and at this stage in my life, certainly, um, that that's my passion to 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 use it for His glory. I mean, whatever whatever He has wired us up to be to do to like golf to to camp, to hike, to whatever it is. Um, and it's not the same for everybody. Right. And, and, and of course that, you know, there's a scripture that says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And, and that includes the outdoors. And so I'm later to the game. Uh, I'm not native to Northern Michigan, although I have lived longer here than any other place. It, you know, it's 20 years just this past November. And it's like, I've lived here longer than everywhere. I mean, people used to ask me, hey, where are you from? I'd say, Port-au-Prince. Where's that? Uh, it's a little island. It's a city down on an island. You know, it's called Hispaniola. The nation is Haiti. Um, so I'm later to the game. And for me, um, embracing the out, I was always outdoors, but it was more like sports. Um, my father took me hunting as a little kid, you know, I, or not hunting, fishing as a little kid. But we're not taking firearms to the mission field. But I did have a BB gun. And so my first hunting experience was alone and it was shooting lizards <laughs> with the BB gun, it, just these tiny little chameleons. And, uh, that was probably pretty ruthless, you know, when you think about it, but you know, I don't want to make anybody sad, but those lizards had to go, yeah, you know, exactly. and, <laughs> and the cool thing is, you know, a couple of them, I kind of got them, you know, here we'd say a little too far in the back, you know, n you know, not behind the shoulder, took off their tail. And then I'd see him later, you know, the next week. It's like, that's the one I got because it's a little stub tail. He's starting to grow back, you know. Later in life. This just here, took a pretty morbid wow. turn. Uh, just a little morbid <laughs> turn. Hey, this wow. is the tabernacle, man. We, just, we don't pull punches. <laughs> yes. But um, but then moving here at 30, um, really wanting to understand the culture. And I had missed out on having a grandfather uh, who taught me how. My father was always buried in the ministry and overseas. You know, he, he had a limited experience with, you know, with the squirrels and the rabbits and a 22 rifle. Um, but when we came back, I remember getting that 22 rifle and then it was like coming to Michigan, it just kind of accelerated. Yeah. And so by God's grace, I've, I've had some guys that have put me in a position to be successful, you know, and so I'm an amateur, but I'm learning, I'm still learning and I love every bit of it. Yeah, I was so, going to say you must you must like it to hang around that long and to be that passionate about it. Oh, hundred percent. I was so proud when I could finally get old Bob to let me gut my own deer. Yeah, because he was always Johnny, move over, you'll hurt yourself. Yeah, you know. And so I'm always <laughs> holding the leg, and then you know when I when I lined it out myself, he, he, who gutted this deer? That was me, Bob. Now you got your daughter's gutting deer. Yeah, yeah. He's done it as well. Uh, we probably that's a little morbid for. You know, Dean's rituals, he hung them in the tree, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I'm fully aware. So, <laughs> you were there? <laughs> yeah. So um, my favorite um, 
My favorite verse in the Bible when it comes to hunting in the outdoors, Acts chapter 10, verse 13, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Can wow. we just take a moment and just say we're, we're so glad that God said to kill and eat. Absolutely. Can you imagine a world without meat? I, I cannot. I cannot. I think even, you know, if you look at the all throughout Genesis where he's uh, specifically given humanity dominion over the earth to there's a. Uh, a part of it that's uh, amazing because we get to provide food f- for the family and we legitimately do like that's that's a whole uh, big piece to this is is that provision factor but also the conservation aspect of it you know if we don't um, do our part then Good. we yeah we have all these animals just running amok and you know you it, it pains me to see animals dead on the side of the road like yeah. I love these animals I love these creatures uh, I love studying them. I love knowing the intricacies of why they do what they do and, and uh, really just uh, uh, thrive in that space of, of studying them. Uh, at the same time, there's a responsibility that we have. We're, uh, we're the caretakers right. and uh, being able to uh, bring them to a spot where they are healthy and the herd's healthy and, and uh, we get to be a part of that as, as outdoorsmen. Oh, yeah. The, I, I have so much family that are not from Michigan. They're not outdoorsmen. And, you know, at the big family reunions, it's like, oh, you're killing deer. And and then someone will say something. We don't have to mention any names, but it it wasn't him, but said in front of him, just can't imagine why anyone would ever want to, you know, shoot one of those beautiful deer. And it's like, well, first they're delicious. Yeah, exactly. And then, (laughs) and then second, um, in Michigan, it's a public service. I mean, it, it isn't like Indiana where they're a little bit sparse compared, well, in some places, I, I, yeah. I guess they're thicker, but up here, we're overrun. <laughs> I mean, we're, it, and, and it, you know, the snow melting like it is right now, you just see in, in the snow banks, I mean, it looks like a war zone. And these are people that now are, you know, paying to fix cars and, you know, hopefully safe, you know, but um, yeah, but Genesis says that we should steward the earth, be fruitful and multiply. And it was after the flood that God said, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. So those are my two favorite. When, yeah. when God says to Peter, kill and eat. And then, in fact, I, th- I think I'm going to market a t-shirt that just says, kill and eat. Yeah. Ooh, maybe hunting the harvest. Let's do it. Just kill Done. it. We'll get Lily. <laughs> Lily will design it. Yep. It'll be epic. Should but, I text her now or wait till yeah. we're done with this? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. Uh, but then that every moving thing shall be food for you. Before we hear some stories, because I do want to hear some of your stories about like, you know, just, just faith lessons you've learned in the outdoors or where you've seen God like show up, because that's the other really cool piece is the experience, is the relationships built. Um, you know, I, I always heard about hunting camp and it wasn't until Bob invited me to one that I had no idea what this camaraderie, this community was. But I wanted to ask you this and you probably know it. First hunter in the Bible. Hmm. Do either of you know this? You may not like it. You may not like it. I can't say that I know well, it. In Techni- fact, he, technically, <laughs> it would be the first time that an animal sacrificed, God sacrificed animals after Adam and Eve's sin. True. Yes. And then- That's the first know. animal that died. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And we and, don't know what kind it was right. when, when he covered their shame. Yeah. And then we have um, Abel. Yeah, I would say Would Abel. sacrifice yeah. after that. Cain sacrificed incorrectly. But then Jacob tells Esau- yeah. To go take up your bow and your quiver. Esau was an archer. Yeah. Well done. Well remembered. <laughs> these, these are parts of yeah. scripture that yeah. are just more important. Yeah, I see your me. memory bank is just going, it's just yeah. going. Ready? Ready yeah. for this? Okay. okay. So he's considered the father of hunting. Well, he's called, because he's the first one, he's called a hunter. So yeah, animals died, but it's in uh, Genesis chapter 10. It says, uh, Cush fathered Nimrod. Memory bank, remember yet? Absolutely. Yeah. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And uh, um, therefore it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. So I had to Google this. I remember preaching through it in Genesis, but Nimrod, great grandson of Noah, he was a king and he was a mighty hunter. And so kind of like in the, you know, I don't know that he, you know, has a sponsorship. I don't know if he ever used the proper, <laughs> you know, equipment, but. Um, he probably uh, wasn't rocking. Right, right, right. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen his equipment. Yeah. So, yeah, so 
so it says, it, and I don't know why this website said this, but it goes, today, a Nimrod is a hunting expert or devotee. So I don't want to offend you guys because mm. you're both bigger than me. I'm just sitting here with a couple of Nimrods. That's right. right. <laughs> but then it also said parentheses. Uh, that's not what it meant in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I would not have taken that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. but you cleaned yeah. it up pretty good. Nimrod. Growing up, if first. somebody was called a Nimrod, they were like, uh, that was a negative connotation. Was, uh, 100%. Yes, yeah. You were a nerd. You were, yeah. And there's going to be some sort of fight or at least words exchanged or whatever. Yeah. So, Adam, first time like you saw or like, sense the presence of God or you, man, it, it was a spiritual experience, a new awareness somewhere on a river, on a lake, in the field, what would have been for you? Um, I think that th that was kind of a, a journey of even connecting those pieces. You know, I'm, I'm in a creative uh, environment, created environment that um, I'm enjoying every possible aspect of, you know, as the, uh, dawn begins to awaken the wildlife around you, there's certain birds that chirp first and then the crows, you begin to hear them and the turkeys are gobbling. And then you have this, the movement of the deer start to filter through wherever the area you're at. Um, I'm aware of those things. I'm not until, uh, probably middle twenties. I'm not really relating those things to, you know, God designed this and created this. That joy that I'm experiencing in that moment is uh, a God's gift to mankind to be able to truly enjoy. Um, I, a lot of hunting for me was, uh, and we've kind of talked about this before, but it's a, a vain pursuit. You know, I'm, I'm after a, a trophy animal. And so there's just this rabid uh, desire to, know and to learn the area and figure out the movement and patterns of this certain animal. And, uh, there, there was a point in time of just even being convicted about the, the vanity of that pursuit and really asking God, you know, you've given me this crazy passion. Like it's something I think about all the time. Um, how do I use it for your glory? And really said, uh, you know, just honestly before him, if this is something that's going to continually uh, be only a, a detractor from my uh, ministry for you, then uh, take it away from me or I'll step out of it, you know, which is like, can I really even do that? <laughs> is that even possible? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's kind of when the whole um, wild game dinner world opened up for me. Mm -hmm. And, but also uh, it allowed me to really slow down and process that. So I would, I would say sometime in, uh, middle 20s i don't know if there's a specific like uh event necessarily right. that um but it was more of just like hey take take the time and uh be aware i can uh, remember a uh moment um with my kids and i'm guessing they were three four five something like that where we were walking out and we um always went shed hunting in february and there was a decent layer of snow and we were walking along this river bank and kind of climbing up and down the hills and just looking and um, as typically goes, you know, I haven't seen a shed and aren't finding anything. But the as the sun started to set that night, there was a, a uh, the, the sunset was kind of cascading across the snow and it's just this perfect sparkle, but it was picking up all the colors. I can see it. And I'm standing there on the wow. hillside and I'm just, I'm like just taking it all in. And I don't even remember which kid it was, but one of them was just like, God is awesome. I'm like, oh, sweet. You, gra <laughs> you grab you. that at five. And yeah. I'm like, poo. Well, yeah. Balling, yeah. Yeah. But I think that um, that was such a reminder that in that space, um, we can, because we are surrounded, we live in northern Michigan. Yeah. There's hardly a day that goes by that there's something magnificent that we get to take in, and we can take that for granted. Instead of constantly being uh, a, uh, in awe of the goodness of a God to create that for his his man for mankind mm -hmm. to enjoy and to give us the opportunity to care for it. Yeah, and it it is profound. Which just a little sidebar uh, for those people from the city, or you have no idea what Adam he was looking for. I think sheds when an antler or when a deer drops his horns when he drops his antler in the 
when when is it? Some January, February. Yeah, I mean they Winter? they started dropping them even in December this year. But gotcha. Yeah, that's a valid um, clarification. Yeah. good job. No, 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 it's good. <laughs> it's just, but like I heard people, hey, I'm hey, I'm hunting for sheds, and when I first heard that, like being like I wasn't afraid to say, okay, what creature is that? Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's and then <laughs> I came to this. Okay, you're both from Michigan. I didn't know they dropped them. Yeah. I just thought they got bigger and no, bigger each good. year. Hey, I'm going to leave it. Next year he's going to be bigger. And so that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But the beauty of creation, um, I think we were talking about this uh, uh, in some, one of our myriad of conversations, but Romans 1 speaks about um, the glory of creation and because of what we can see, everything that God has made, just the testimony of creation, no man is without excuse before God. That's right. You can't walk. And for me, I know being kind of startled, not startled, surprised by beauty. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when I first started hunting, I was all about the animal. Yeah. Let's, I was all about shooting. Right. It was, and, and as I did it more and more, and, you know, I used to um, talk all the time in messages about I'm the only man in northern Michigan that hadn't shot a deer. And it wasn't for lack of trying. No one took me. They all went to their spots, and then they were like, sure, you can use my backwoods. There's nothing in there. I got trail cameras back there. But I was all about that, and it wasn't until I settled down and slowed down that I actually realized, man, sitting in a deer blind and just watching the woods wake up, to quote Lee McBride, is a spiritual experience. It is. My wife doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. You're alone? Yeah. She can't fathom that. It's quiet? Yeah. I mean, unless I put a headphone in and listen to you know, the tab podcast or something, you know, Jocko or a story or whatever. Um, but the beauty is just, it's stunning. And then to just stop and I don't do that enough. I don't slow down enough. I'm go, go, go. Mm-hmm. And it's forced me to kind of see that. And really some of my most spiritual experiences have happened in a deer blind, all alone, freezing, yep. you know, but like, I'm just going to wait Yeah, 20 more minutes, you know, or like I said, see the woods wait. Matt, what about for you? Um, you know, when I was 13, 14, 15, I, we couldn't, we couldn't hunt with a rifle for deer till we were 14 at that time. So I'm glad to see that change. But, uh, my dad would take my brother and I, my brother, Jeff, who's a year and some change younger, he would take us out camping and deer hunting every year in the, in those ages. And he would not only take me and my brother, but he would take me and my brother and our friends. So he'd be the only adult in the group and he'd have six or seven or eight of us youngsters running around. And of course he never shot any deer in those days. He's too busy taking care of us. But I, I remember a time when, um, my next door neighbor, my friend, John, uh, had an exchange student and from Germany and his name was Gerhardt and he went hunting with us and we were in our, in, in the boat on the river. We were always around the river for some reason. That's we were river rats, but still am. But we're going up this river, watching the salmon swim around, watching the ducks fly, and uh, some geese come overhead, and my dad looked up at those geese and said, wow, God's creation, it's just beautiful, isn't it? And Gerhardt pipes up from the back and says, there's no God. What are you talking about? Oh, it's on. (laughs) What are you talking about? I know your dad. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, having grown up in the church, having been around it, having... You know, that's all I knew. I never considered that there might not be a God there, that, what, what, where is this coming from? Are you mm. kidding me? And it was such a shock that, you know, we didn't get into a debate over it. It was just what was said. We all knew where he was coming from. He knew where we were coming from. And it was, it was a jaw, jaw dropping experience. Mm. Well, 15, 20 years later, we heard that Gerhardt had accepted Jesus in <laughs> Germany and was, uh, and was in fact, uh, in the ministry. You're and, kidding. Uh, no, I'm not kidding. Wow. And, and I've never, I've always thought, I'm convinced that that was Gerhardt's start of his journey. Mm-hmm. I'm sure as, just as we were shocked by the fact that somebody could actually think there's no God, he was shocked. Like, likewise, that he was in a boat with a bunch of, people that thought that knew. <laughs> yeah. 
that, yes, God exists and he created this. And I'm sure that was the start of Gerhardt's journey. And I've always since then known that, you know, those little things, and that was just my dad being faithful, hmm. um, you know, being unselfish and taking us kids to begin with, because hmm. if he wanted to kill a nice buck, he wouldn't have packed all of us along. Hmm. Right. But it's always something I've aspired to since. I mean, oh, I, th absolutely. I think it was just, uh, That's huge. just riveting. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I, I, amen, you know. What can you say? Yeah, well, you know, you, you guys are both mentioning kids, your dad with you and, and your friends and, or your brother and your friends, and then you, were, you mentioned something with your kids. Um, that is one of the greatest joys. Uh, and so I can't remember how long, it, how long ago it was, but my daughter, my oldest daughter, our oldest daughter, Isabel, was probably 14 and had, had become pretty proficient. And, you know, we had a rifle. We had her all set up. She's got great eyes open sites We're you know, we're in a tower, it's the youth hunt. So, you know, if it's Brown, it's, it's down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean that in all the context of deer, right. Yeah. And, um, uh, she shot her first deer and, um, you know, just like I'm looking at her, you know, how is, cause at this point I've, I've only shot one deer myself or no, I maybe two. Um, and I'm watching like how she's going to respond and she, all the excitement. She was so excited. Um, probably wasn't focusing too much on the beauty and I don't gross anybody out, but as we're, um, field dressing the deer, I, you know, the Michigan term is gutting, right. And, and old Bob's there helping us get it done. And, uh, I, I was trying to anticipate how she would respond to it because, you know, it's, it can be messy and. There's blood, right? Um, but as he opens up this deer, uh, she and I found ourselves talking about, you know, because you know, he's pointing out all the parts. Mm -hmm. It's like an anatomy lesson. Yeah. You know, it, it's the, uh, the most intense, you, you know, when you're in science class and you're going to dissect a frog or, you know, if it's really aggressive in college, it's a cat or something else we won't go into. But I've seen the beauty of creation, you know, like we talked about, a sunrise or as the sun goes down or these beautiful animals, but opening it up inside there, I saw God's design. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I read the Bible and I'm a nerd, but I'm just sitting there going, he packed everything in that, at this point, a carcass um, in the exact right place to make, for example, the white-tailed deer. Somebody told me still the, the, the number one game hunter's choice, still the, everything about that thing was designed to evade, mm -hmm. and, which makes it the challenge. And now I'm looking on the inside. So it's not just God's beauty we see in the outdoors. We see the amazing design. No question. And, and, and she saw it. And, and so immediately all the gross was gone. And she's like, oh, what does that do? And what does that mm -hmm. do? We're having science class right out there. Yeah. You know, I mean, she didn't want to get her hands up in, in it, you know, at 14. She would now, but... Um, yeah, just seeing that with my kid, well, with all of my kids, it's always the same thing. You know, it's like, look at the beauty on the outside, look at the design on the inside, mm -hmm. and it and it's breathtaking. I mean, if yeah. you can get past the, yeah, know, even the uh, uh, just the different stomach chambers of a white-tailed deer and the ability for them to you know basically gorge yeah. themselves out in the field and then retreat to cover, and they you know spit up and chew their cud and and the whole digestive process if we were to try to take in uh 10 pounds of raw forage in in a one sitting it's an impossibility um but they're able to do that with the different stomach chambers and see god's hand in design and knowing that they would be an animal that needed to seek shelter and hide during the daytime and and still uh, have a snack yeah exactly exactly still have a snack. And, 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 you know, not to make this an apologetics thing, but how does that possibly evolve? Exactly. You know, how does that, yeah. it, the design is, and I'm sure we could say that, you know, for, for all of those types of creatures, yep. but where else, where have you seen like some profound, like God moments? Um, I would say the, one of the first times that I really was, um, I, uh, my prayer shifted in going to the woods from God help me shoot this big buck um, to God, if this big buck gives me opportunity to give you glory, 
then let me shoot this big buck. You're really praying that before you go in the deer. Genuinely, every oh. time. And if it's if it's not that prayer, it's specifically give me a story that helps me communicate your gospel more clearly. And uh, I had a scenario in um, uh, on a big piece of property in Indiana with a group of buds. Uh, I'd been invited there the year before to hunt, and uh, they had... Um, I'm trying to, the reason that I'm hesitating is like, okay, this is a little bit longer story. So I'm, no, th- I'm going to just is, drop it on you. <laughs> Brit and Bishop would say, this is our podcast. We yeah, do whatever we want. Exactly. So go on. All right. So. Wait, sorry. This might be Hunting Stories Part 1. Uh, yes. This might be a recurring theme because we are Northern Michigan. So yeah, go. I like yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So the uh, a buddy of mine, Brent, who's uh, an evangelist, you've talked to him. Yeah. Um, he's uh, preaching at a church in Logansport, Indiana. And he asked me to come and, and lead the singing and do all this part. So uh, from that ministry together on Sunday, we're headed straight to deer camp. And we're going to a farm that I've never been to before. Been invited graciously by friends. And uh, it's a little over 500 acres. And so we minister together. And then we decided that we were going to set like a, a theme verse and a prayer for the week. And so the the verse was Jeremiah 33, 3, calling me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things, which you do not know. Mm. And so that was our, our prayer going into this, this weekend. So we, um, get to camp about 10 o'clock at night, walk into the little farmhouse that's been renovated and, uh, it just has that like warm inviting, you know, at, the way it is when you walk into good friends' homes and, uh, and knowing that, uh, the next morning you're walking out into brand new woods that you've never seen before, new adventures, new deer, um, historically very large deer. And so they start to show me, they flip open laptops, start showing me camera pics and, uh, trail cam pics. And so this is a buck. He's three years old. Don't shoot him. And this buck's this old. Don't shoot him. And this buck is seven years old. Definitely don't shoot him. That's, you know, spoken for, for the rest of these bucks in here in that four to six year old range, any of those are, are good to go. So I'm, you know, trying to go to bed, try to sleep and not sleeping well, get up, we're up at 4.30, have breakfast, we head to the woods. And as they drop me off, they're like, now you need to walk down this fence row and then you're going to come to a little low area, turn left and, you know, give all these instructions. And I'm trying to left, right, right, left, look up. <laughs> and so you finally get to the, the spot and I'm like crouched down trying to silhouette this tree stand in the sky that's starting to get light more rapidly than I would hope. Get in the tree stand finally and it's, as a bow hunter, you're like, uh, I'm always looking for a tree that's got great cover and I can tuck in and be hid. And this tree stands, a ladder stand sitting on the side of a tree with no branches. And I'm like, oh, I'm never killing anything out of this tree. And, but I'm hunting with a gun, something that I hadn't done very much, just usually have the bow in hand. And uh, I sat there for most of the morning, watched tons of bucks go by. Can't determine if they're old enough, young enough. I'm from Michigan, you know, like... If it's a good looking buck, I'm shooting it. I would be completely lost. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I can't determine an age. So I, about 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd been resting my shotgun, Remington 870 Wingmaster on uh, a uh, monopod, which is a pointless tool. And so (laughs) I'm sitting there, you know, doing this number all morning and trying to balance and get get steady and knowing that I wouldn't have a ton of space to move um, just because I'm not high in the tree and I'm very much silhouetted like they're going to see me. And uh, so I hang up my gun, I'm going to have a snack, and they had made me a sandwich. Um, and I, I can't stand white bread. So I, I take the sandwich, and I'm watching, and so I'm just kind of unwrapping. I'm not really paying attention, and so I take a giant bite, and it's a, a peanut butter on white bread sandwich. So, yeah, now I've got this <laughs> this glob. <laughs> it's a glob. I can taste just the kinda, glob. Just kind of stuck in my mouth. No jelly? Come on, uh, yeah. man. Just something to wash it down with. And so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I've already had the thought in trying to get it out of the Ziploc bag that the Ziploc bag is made by PETA. You know, like <laughs> you try to get something out of that bag quietly. <laughs> yeah, and just, yeah. Every and, noise uh, is yeah. accentuated. So um, all of a sudden, uh, while I'm engrossed in the attempt to remove this taste from my mouth um here comes a giant buck down the hill and so without even like thinking through all of the pictures and really processing um this buck that they told me not to kill was trident was his name they named him they named him on his left side was this big giant mainframe with kickers it was just gorgeous on the right side 
out of the same base off of the main beam were three points that came up oh, like 12, yeah. 13 inches. Just so just like a trident. Yeah. yeah. So I look at this buck and on his right side, he did not have that trident. And so I just immediately, you know, scoped him up, boom. And like any good Michigander, I had five shells. I, sh- I used all of them. And so <laughs> I- Because in Indiana, you got these shotguns. Yeah, at that time, or, yeah, yeah. Now yeah. you can use rifle, but okay, at that time yeah. it was shotguns. Yeah. And so um, buck runs off and drops. And so I call the guys. I'm like, I just got a big buck. You know, I'm shaking and all the adrenaline surging through the veins. And when they pull up, um, I can remember vividly him saying, he killed Trident. And I'm like, how did I kill Trident? It, he didn't have the- and he had broken off one of the three tridents on that side, so only had two. And I'd killed the the one buck not to kill on the farm. He was a seven year old. Yep. Oh my days! Yeah. You're a guest. I'm a guest. So, um, that's the setup story to what I was going to actually. No, say. go for it, man. Yeah. So they uh, graciously invite me back the next year. We decided then that we were going totally to the archery world. Uh, we're not going to use guns because we, uh, Brent and I both killed giant bucks that week. And, uh, it, it, it was a, we were close friends then, but it was like a solidifying a trip because we're praying these prayers together, praying for family, praying for church ministry, praying for all these things and praying Jeremiah 33, three. And then, you know, we're driving home like with two giant bucks and, uh, but we switched to archery for the next year. Everybody was just going to use archery equipment and we get, uh, set up on the this farm to where we're resetting stands, we're setting food plots, trimming trees, trimming lanes, just for the archery world. And uh, I fixated on some of the bucks that we started seeing on trail camera. Um, they're on my cell phone. They're my back, you know, this, the lock screen. Mm-hmm. They're on my laptop. It's something I'm thinking about so often that I'm, you know, I get home from the office, run out, get my arrows shot. And uh, Chuck Adams says that uh, 10 good arrows a day is an important way to shoot. Um, and I just thought, well, you just need to multiply that by 10 <laughs> and then you'll be fine. Which, so you're shooting 100 a yeah, day. Just, wow. just getting a lot of uh, uh, bad habits more than anything. But, but I was fine-tuning the different shots and shot angles that I, I thought would be created by what I had seen in uh, tree stands and distances. Mm-hmm. And well, that if he walks into that food plot off that trail, it's going to be 27 yards. And so I'm shooting at 27 yards. And if I'm in this tree, it's going to be 31 yards with that kind of thought. You're getting technical. Well then, uh, hunt seven days. And on the seventh day, I've passed a lot of good bucks, but on the seventh day, I finally see the buck that I'm after. And he's just a giant mainframe, 10 point kickers, uh, just gorgeous. And he comes out into the field, a uh, hundred yards away into a cut soybean field. And slowly begins to work towards the west, which is diagonaling away from the food plot I'm sitting over. And there's a small eight point and a doe in the food plot with me. It's a turnip food plot. And they have those uh, big giant long leaves that grow off of them. And so I'm I'm just being amused by these animals picking up this leaf and it's hanging up both sides. It's and funny to watch. Know, trying to get yeah. it all in the yeah. mouth. And uh, as he starts angling away, like I'm watching my hopes of killing this buck this last night, last hour, uh, fade away into the distance. So I pull out the grunt call and I'm like, you know, just hammering on this grunt call. Probably sound more like a tuba than, than anything natural. And uh, <laughs> but clarinet. He, he hears it and he, he looks back. And uh, so I grunt again and I snort wheeze at him. And he postures up, rubs uh, or uh, Stands on his hind legs, rubs his preorbital glands, tarsal glands, makes a scrape, gets all crazy, and then just postures all the way across that field. And I think he's thinking that that, I mean, my desire was that he's thinking that that little eight point is challenging him. He comes running into the food plot, and as he runs into the food plot, he stops at like 20 yards. So I come to full draw, and then just as soon as I get to full draw, he shoots out the other side of the food plot, chasing that buck off. So I let down. Grab the grunt call, grunt. He runs back into the food plot, stops broadside at 20 yards. I come to full draw. And a shot that I have done thousands of times with precision. I have no idea to this day what I did, but I missed. Didn't even touch him at 20 yards. And I like. You've been doing hundreds of reps. Hundreds of reps. For a year. Yeah. In preparation for that shot. The interesting thing is, so I, I hang my bow up and I'm, I'm like dumbfounded. And not to be like, uh, um, 
this can sound boastful and this is not the intent. It's just yeah. simply I've not missed a deer before in my life at that point. So there's a, a like a shock and awe, a surreal just pit feeling in my gut. Like you don't get a do-over in that moment. Mm. But as I was sitting in my tree stand, God, uh, you know, I'm, I'm praying like, because I have a bad attitude at that moment. <laughs> and I, I, I need to call my wife. I can't imagine and, you with a bad attitude. Yeah, but I, I need to call my wife and just be like, hey, uh, d- I'm coming home. I didn't kill a deer. I didn't kill my buck. And I got to tell her I missed, which is just like a weird realization. Uh, but Romans 3.23 came to mind. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, fall short to miss the mark. In that moment, I recognized that Wow. reality of no matter how hard I try, I'm, I'm a human and I have the human condition of I'm not perfect. And the beauty of that is I've told that story so many times leading into presenting the gospel of, you know, we do all kinds of vain, repetitious mm-hmm. things with our good works and with our endeavors and our attempts to appease or please a God that in his perfection says you're, you're even your righteousness is as filthy rags. And uh, so... You know, I look back at that. Of course, I would have loved to kill that buck. Right. If I'd have killed that buck, I probably would have never told the story again. Right. You know, other than when somebody sees it on my wall. Isn't that, uh, it, but isn't that crazy? It, it, it becomes a story. And I, I'm trying to think of who said this first. It was probably unrelated. It was probably Jocko. It had something to do with leadership in jiu-jitsu. But he made a statement one time. Once you see the path, you see it everywhere. Yeah. And he was talking about something completely unrelated. And I was listening to that in a weight room. But I think it applies to the outdoors. Once you, like your friend, um, who uh, uh, had that moment where there is no God, right. but your dad knows or knew the path, he sees him everywhere. Same thing with you. Yeah. You see the path. You see the glory of creation. You know the story of the gospel is way more than just redeeming us. It's redeeming creation. Yeah. And once you see the path, those things come to mind. But that's a powerful reminder. Absolutely. Because I remember the first time I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was the, it was the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I didn't have a mono stick. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was similar. But um, yeah, that's... Like I, it's a beautiful sermon what you just shared. But it's like it become it was a process for me to get to a space where um, I'm asking God, I'm pleading with Him at the end of this whole adventure. Oh, yeah. Give me opportunities to communicate Your goodness or Your op- opportunities to com- com- th- communicate yeah. the gospel because there's a there's so much more that's greater than just the kill of of an animal or just the uh, ability to throw something on the wall. Mm. And, um, those are, uh, you know, as we talk often about temporal pursuits that are, have their short term in their, uh, the joy that they bring, but they're also short term in their value. Um, but hearts changed, lives changed for the gospel through the gospel is a, uh, just such an incredible opportunity to communicate that in, in through the outdoors. And isn't even just like God is. I've got my idea of how I'm going to bring you glory. Yeah. And he's like, watch this. Yep. You're going to bring me glory through your weakness, Absolutely. through your failing. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah, that's awesome. Matt, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking I'm having a hard time relating to Adam's story. I, I once missed 13 deer <laughs> in one season. In one season. I never did get a deer that season. Now I had a- With a bow or rifle? With a bow. Yeah. But it was with a uh, bear Kodiak, 65 pound bow, and I'm probably- 14 years old and couldn't pull it. So, but I could shoot at him. Yeah. I had a, I had a riot. So I've missed, um, plenty hmm. since that okay. time. That's better. Yeah. Just for clarity. That's better. I would love to say the only time I've ever missed a deer. It's not true. Yeah. Well, that, that's also part of the experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, Benji ever miss a deer? Yes. <laughs> he, he, he missed, uh, Hey, is there, don't talk. About, okay. Sorry. He missed a monster. And, uh, um, and he's shot a lot of deer and he, he's, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to say, I'm not afraid to say this. He's a better shot than me. Uh, he's got better eyes. Um, he practices more and that was hard. Um, and then I remember guys like you and like my nephew, Cody, guys he looks up to, uh, the guy we were with, it's like, Hey, I've missed big deer. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's part of the experience. Yeah. It's, I, I think it's also what brings us back, but it does remind us that we fall short. 
I love how you brought that with despite your best efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was despite uh, just not thinking about it, right? Yeah. My, my first time I shot at a deer was a borrowed rifle, untested, like I'd never shot this thing. Mm. Of, of my nephew, Uncle John, this is sighted in. I already used it. I already got my deer. Just go ahead and go. Well, it, I didn't, I had no clue that sighted in, you know, those are different eyes. Those are different hands. It's a different trigger pull. You know, your different bodies are going to set up on that scope differently. Mm -hmm. um, and my nephew didn't realize that in his joy to get his deer, he probably dropped that rifle or banged it, putting it in the truck um, because I messed it one out at Doug King's without a mono stick um, and had no clue how I could possibly miss this thing at 70 yards until my friend Doug was, well, let's check that rifle. And the scope, uh, uh, well, without giving you all the details because my stories aren't as cool as yours, <laughs> um, he said, uh, John, you missed that deer by my estimation uh, a foot high and a foot left. That's how far off it was wow. for, you know, kind of how, and so lesson learned. Uh, but that, even that, um, you know, I've gone into the field with a rifle where, okay, it's two inches off or it's an inch off at 50 yards or a hundred yards. No big deal. Yeah. But what about it? 200. Now that's way more than one inch off. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's the same thing with sin, you know, is I m can make little compromises. Well, it's no big deal. Um, but what about over the course of a life mm -hmm. as that range gets 40 years old, 50 years old, that little thing at 20, that's no big deal. That's for spiritual people, not for yeah. me. It's okay if I'm a little off, sin is missing the mark. Yeah. If I'm off a little bit at my age now, wow, that's going to lead to a, ca a catastrophic failing, you know? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, we see this in people all the time. So Your, uh, your story reminds me, um, heard young uh, often at a very young age, uh, to aim small, miss small. Right. In this idea of picking a spot on an animal that is tiny and honing in on that. And the perspective is, is if that, if I aim at a small pinpoint, uh, target and I miss by an inch, I'm still in that vitals. If I'm shooting at a, uh, you know, brown, right. As soon as it yeah. comes into the scope and it's just like, Oh, and I react, then I am, um, missing. And when we have, you know, to relate it back to your, uh, perspective on sin, even just those little margins mm -hmm. when we're not aiming a pinpoint, you know, I'm not, uh, attempting in my, uh, walk with Christ to constantly be sanctified mm -hmm. and removing sin and those pieces. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Then I am, uh, you know, I'm just getting further and further away from the actual target point, that little pine fine tuned point And, and my target path is growing so big that I'm missing by a ton and I don't even know it. Oh, that's um, so true. I'm, dude, that, that's true in a marriage, Yeah. right? Those little things, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know the Proverbs as well as I should. Uh, maybe that's why I'm not wise, but, you know, there's something about the little foxes, you know, just letting the little things, you know, I've heard a, a sermon on that before about when those little things get into the crop or get into the, you know, it didn't say the hen house, but um, those little compromises eventually turn into big compromises and it all starts with not aiming small, missing small, saying no. Not that we can earn it. We're not saying that, Tab family, that we can earn our salvation or, um, you know, it's only by God's grace that we can even please him with our works. But uh, yeah, it's a powerful lesson. No question. Yeah, it's good. I think even, uh, you know, if somebody's listening and they're not into the outdoors, you know, if you watch the uh, Lions game against the 49ers. The oh night. yeah. It, it was eventually going to make it on the podcast because yeah. we but, love football too. <laughs> but like the, you know, you watch Reynolds drop two passes that were massively significant. You think about how many thousands of reps that guy's, uh, how many wow. catches he's completed, how much practice time work, you know, even down to the intricacies of the type of glove and the level of sticky mm. on the glove. Yeah and uh, drops those passes, you know, that's that constant reminder that we live in a fallen state and we're not perfect. Oh, I saw his so. face. I saw a close-up on his face. Yeah. I mean, 
the kid looks like he's about 16. He does. He looks like he's <laughs> like a 60. As I get and older, he, these guys, I'm like, what? when did they start these are children. putting younger yeah, dudes on the field? When did they let children <laughs> in the NFL? But he yeah. was just devastated. And, you know, I wonder even at that time if you realize that it was a significant loss until you lose the game. And mm-hmm. then, you know, with replay, you're going back. I mean, and, and they were ruthless. Yeah. All of the highlight shows, they kept showing, you know, those moments. And it's like, oh, yeah. I man, loved I just, uh not to get too sidetracked, but no, no, no. I hey, did love sorry. after his second uh, drop um, that was literally right in the bread basket, just boom, drops it. I remember that one. Um, as he's running to the sideline, Dan Campbell comes over, smiles at him, pats him on the back, like, you're good. Yeah. You got this. And that was a, a cool uh, coach inside perspective to how he coaches. Uh, there's a genuineness there. And uh, I'm still... Verdict's still out on how much I love Dan Campbell, but right, right, but, right. Uh, yeah. I do like what the results of the season were. Look forward to next. So yeah, it's good. It's you kind of got to dance with the date that brought you. And yep. so, like a bunch of people were like, "Oh, why did he go for it?" It's like, well, that's how they got there. So it you is. can't, you no can't, question, can't change. But give me a uh, funniest thing you've ever experienced in the wild, like a, a literal laughter moment. Well, one I one I laugh about the most anymore. It could have been a very uh, could have been a crier, but uh, going back to my young young days, uh, uh, hunting with uh, Gerhardt from Germany, and how and and how he got a license, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't even know how you do that. Now. <laughs> I think Probably it seems like hunter safety was in in by then, but maybe not. But we we're uh, walking out of our tent, my dad in the lead, and uh, probably six seven of us behind him in the dark. And he's taking us out and going to set us up on our spots. And uh, very, very quiet, of course, just the sound of footsteps. Boom! Rifle fires in the back of the line. And we all stop. And we kind of check on ourselves. Dad says, everybody, everybody all right? <laughs> we got anybody need to go back to the tent? No, we're all good. And then you, then, then I hear the voice from Gerhardt. Sorry, Mr. Stevens. I was just checking my safety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah always check it, pulling oh, the trigger. Oh, that was, it, it's funny now. It's yeah. funny now, but, uh, wow. wow. What a that moment. That could have been a horrible, yeah. just the opposite. So, uh, so speaking of fear, have you ever been really afraid? Oh yeah, yeah, I have. I think I think you know for for a large part of my life, for for a lot of it, I I didn't walk with Jesus. I kept him kept him back. Mm-hmm. I'm a very selfish person for the most part, and 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 so um, I like to go bear hunting a lot. I've done a lot of bear hunts up in Ontario. I love this one. And, I think I might have heard. Well, part of I this don't one, know, yeah. but you know, I it got to be where. A tree stand was cool to kill him from a tree stand, but then I got to got to sitting on the ground for a few years, and that kind of up the up the atmosphere, up the danger level, whatever. And most of that's between your ears, but it it did seem like a lot more adventure. But I do remember multiple times I'd park I'd park the wheeler uh, a mile from where I was going to hunt, you know, walk in archery. Of course, then you got to walk out. And after sitting, wait, 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 you're hunting bear with a bow. Yeah. Okay. So you are up in the level. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I bet it, at least it seems that way when you're doing it. So, yeah. um, but I do remember sometimes I literally was scared walking out and having watched bears for a few hours, uh, listening to them crunch on some bones in the bait pile, you know, and then you start, you start thinking that, Ooh. I, I, I'm, I'm walking in the dark with a bow and there's a lot of bears around here. Right. So even though I wasn't, uh, in communication with, with God, the way that I should have been, I, I knew who to call on. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I had to say, God, can you see me? I'm here. I still believe. Right. Right. I right. still believe, man. I, I just, uh, I need your help right here. And so it was a constant reminder through hunting right. of, of the proper order of things. I just didn't have them in proper order at the time. Right. I thought you were going to tell us, well, the 
the deer that poked his head in the tent. Well, that was a That's, bear. Or, or, sorry, the bear. <laughs> I'm going to say bear. The bear that poked his head in the tent because that was what my friend Ryan would say, squeaky bum time. Yeah. But this that, was after you're walking with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, like, that yeah. was after, and it wasn't quite as, uh, you know, it, could, it there, there was a time when I was sitting on the ground and the bear walked up behind me. I was in a tent, so I had some protection around me, so to speak. But yeah. he, this bear walks around the tent and literally— uh, looks in and he doesn't have his nose inside the tent, but he's within inches and he's looking in and he's smelling. Cause I'm, I, of course I got my bait bucket inside my little tent because I want to have scent cover, you know, real smart. Right? Yeah. Super. <laughs> oh my. And, uh, you've got food in the, what Matt's calling yeah, a tent is a little pop-up blind. Yeah. A little pop-up right? yeah, blind. Yeah, and I yeah. think he's probably smelling the food and he's not smelling me or he'd have ran off. I'm sure. But, uh, there was a moment when I was trying to figure out, should I holler at this thing and get him to go away? Or will that hollering like cause him to run through the tent or just what? So in, in kind of a moment of petrified fear, I, he finally, he finally turns and walks out to where I get far enough away where I can shoot him. But yeah, I mean, that's part of the thrill of hunting is, right. is, is adventure and, and, um, Bear hunting will give that to you. Moose hunting will give that to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I think, like you were talking about walking out in the dark. Yeah. And I can remember, I probably used this in a sermon years ago. Uh, this is before I'd shot a deer. Uh, my friend who's let me use his property said, well, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a tree blind up on a, uh, I don't know what you call it. It's an elevated tree blind. And you need to get down in the swamp because this is like day 10 of rifle season. And then it's always like, they've gone undercover. You got to go get those terrorist white tail deers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, and so, uh, I found it real easy. Like you had, to, but it was a challenge to get through the swamp. It's overlooking a swamp. And, um, and I was going at night and I get up there and it was a great hunt. And just cause it was new, like you'd said, you know, there's times when it's like, okay, I've, I've seen the sun come up on the field. Now I'm going to see the sun go down in a swamp and there's beauty there. And I never knew there was such a thing as a black squirrel till I moved to Northern Michigan. And that, like, literally I'm texting my wife going, I think I've seen a mutant. And yeah. she's like, oh no, we got them ever. You know, I've lived here five years and I've never seen a black squirrel. Sun's going down, sun's going down. And did see deer, but I'm like, I'm going to wait to the last possible second. Cause now I'm Elmer Fudd. I'm, you know, I'm going to get this webbit and, yeah. and just, I'm just focused. Well now, by the time I tried to close it or I closed up shop, it's completely dark. And I'm, you know, I come down the stairs, I make the rifle safe. I've got my stuff, pull out a flashlight within five minutes. I'm helplessly lost deep in the swamp. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was about a half mile walk back there. But I'm deep in a swamp. I don't know which way is north. I don't know which way is south. And of course, I'm telling the congregation, they're laughing their butts off. And what I didn't realize is when everything is, and it was really thick too. So it's a swamp and I'm in thick brush and fallen trees. And everywhere I point the flashlight, it all looks the same. Mm. And I've got no clue how to get out of here until I cut the light. And then waited for a second. And then all of a sudden my eyes start to adjust and I can see, I can get my direction by, you know, just the last glow of the sun. Mm -hmm. And then I can see silhouettes further away because the light was illuminating everything right in front of me. And I couldn't see far until I, until I shut off the flashlight. And then I could see the silhouettes of, oh, high grounds that way. That's where I came from. So I'm bumbling and stumbling through, you know, falling in the marsh and made it out of the swamp alive. You know, we'd have to send a search party for the preacher, but there was a lesson in there for me as well. You know, I, I, I don't remember exactly how I attached it, but, um, it had something to do with, uh, like the spiritual lesson is it's hard to see what the goal is when I'm focused on everything right here. Yeah. When this is all I can see is my circumstances right now, I can't see where God's taking, I can't see where the high ground is. Yeah. But if, you know, that moment of cutting the light, oh, I still had it in my hand, yeah. you know, but cutting the light was a moment of trust and leaving it off until I was able to get out of there. Then I used the light to find the path or whatever. Yeah, but, uh, that's good. Yeah, that was big for me. And no you, were, you were encased in a, 
square mile of road network, right? Uh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I'd have just gone in one direction for a long time, I'd eventually hit a road. I, I yeah. couldn't but, help it. But it was fear because I, you know, I'd never done that before. Now, you know, you guys dropped me off at the UP at Dean, Dean, Dean Hulse's place. And he's like, yeah, we're going to drive 30 minutes and drop you off on a two track, follow this fence line, take a left and a right, look for a little orange, you know, blinker hanging off a bush. So- you know, I guess that comes getting with lost but. will definitely get your attention. You've ever been lost? Oh yeah. I don't know that you can hunt without getting lost at some point, but for sure. You've ever been lost? Oh yeah. It, the very first time that I hunted in Northern Michigan, when we moved up here, I hunted a piece of state land and hiked back with a climber on my back and climbed a tree. Um, but what had happened is I climbed a tree and then realized that there was a, you know, the trail that I was setting up on was okay. There's a much better trail back in. So I moved to that. Then I hated the tree. So I just kind of danced around. And the whole time, unknowingly, I'm disorienting myself as to what I knew was Hmm. true north, south, east, west. And then I climbed down and I'm like, I don't remember which direction I'm supposed to walk. So I start walking. I come to a field edge and I'm like, well, this is not the right direction. And I turn around and walk back into the thicker timber and nothing is making sense. And I never carry a flashlight for that reason. But at that moment, I was like, it'd be cool to have a flashlight right now. And uh, eventually run into a boot track that I assumed was mine and backtracked my boot tracks. But Oh, you just followed your trail out? Mm-hmm. Now, was it dark? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. That's when you're, oh, man, I hope the cell phone works. <laughs> it did not. It was dead. Oh, you had a dead yeah. cell phone. Yep. No GPS, nothing. I had nothing. So even was, my compass is on my phone and it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. It's trying to tell me this way's north. And I'm exactly. like, that can't be north. The sun's right there. Yeah. I know that's not north. You yeah. know, I, uh, when I got home that night, uh, I was considerably later than what Rach expected. And she's like, well, I thought you got one tonight. And I was like, well, actually, <laughs> let me tell you a little story. I got lost. I, got lost. <laughs> I haven't done that before, but I got very lost. So there, was, there's something very humbling about being a grown man and being lost. Yeah. Because even if you're in a car, it's like, I can find a road, yep. you know, I'll figure it out. And eventually I might ask directions. Right. But being lost on foot in the middle of God's creation where you don't know. And, and I haven't hunted some of the places that both of you have hunted. Uh, I think you've hunted Alaska. Mm-hmm. Have you hunted Alaska? I have before? not hunted Alaska. But you've been in Canada. I've fished Alaska. You fished Alaska. Yeah. You got fishing stories for us? Well, I'd have to make, I'd have to embellish them to make them. You'd have to embellish them. <laughs> hey, listen, Jesus said he'd make us fishers of men. So if it was good enough for Jesus, good enough That's for right. Matt. Yeah. Yeah. But fear, have you ever been really afraid? Yeah. I would say, um, different story. Him telling bear stories reminded me of a couple of, uh, moments in the bear woods. But I think the, um, the time that I was most afraid while hunting was in Alaska Mm-hmm. And we had, um, I had our buddy Matt with us and my two boys, two other friends, but they were hunting a different mountain range at the time. And we had left uh, spike camp, which uh, we set up a base camp down on a lagoon, float plane flew us in, set up our, our base camp. And then when the weather cleared, we hiked out with our little tents and That's all that a, stuff. That must have just been gorgeous. Like there, I, like I probably a, need a picture. Yeah. Like put a picture on the podcast, just see how Absolutely. gorgeous that was. Um, I, I did like a little video when we first landed on that lagoon, just to try to capture, you know, you're surrounded by these mountains that are just gorgeous. They're, they're totally green and then just capped with the, the rock on mm-hmm. them. And, um, some of them still had a little snow on the tops of them. And, um, but as we leave that spike camp, uh, we were, um, Hudson and I had taken, both boys had killed caribou. So Hudson and I packed these caribou out with Matt and Kenton. And then we were going to wait for the float plane to come in and do a meat run. We were just hanging it on mm-hmm. uh, this little tripod we made down by the, um, by the base camp. And so Hudson and I said, well, we'll wait down here. Kenton had shorter days. He and I were leaving because of him being in college. So we uh, stayed down at base camp, waited for the float plane. We load everything up and Matt and him went back the night before so that they could be fresh in the morning, glass in the mountainside looking for black tailed deer. And as we're, Hudson and I, we meet the flow plane and we're hiking back. It's about two and a half miles and it's uh, probably a two hour, two and a half hour hike with all the gear and, and just the type of terrain. 
And um, it was an interesting process in that hike because the first time we'd hiked it, I we followed our, our buddy Matt that had been there five or six times and he had kind of a, a pre-drawn trail in his brain of we're going to avoid this and we're going to do this. And so I'm trying to re uh, count his steps and remember a little, well, that bush was on our left side when we came through right, here. And, right. You're counting and, bushes. Yeah. And you know, you've got the grizzly bears everywhere. So um, we've already seen several of them in trying to pack out these caribou. And uh, so we're, I'm avoiding alder thickets and I'm avoiding any uh, brush that's over my head. I don't want to walk through that. And um, so whether, you know, that fear was warranted or not, I, I don't know. That just the way I was processing it was like, if I can see, I at least have a fighting chance, you know. And uh, so we, as we're just pulling into, uh, back into spike camp, we set all of our stuff down and sit down and we hear a rifle shot up on the mountain. So like, yeah, that's gotta be Ken. So we, um, uh, wait for a little bit and then we see, I'm glass, I've got the spotting scope out and I'm just watching the mountaintop and I see him walking across the ridge of the mountain. And so then I see them with their binoculars looking back towards spike camp to see if we were there. So I get out a big white game bag and I'm, you know, waving it so they could see us and they're waving us up. So we, you know, we just get done hiking all the way out there and we load our stuff back on our backs and start hiking up the mountain. It took us about an hour and a half to get to them and Kenton had killed this beautiful black tail. And so we pack uh, everything on, you know, quarter everything, get it put in game bags on everybody's backs. And then Matt goes, hey, Adam, why don't uh, you and I just keep going and let's, the boys can hike this back and you and I will go over the next mountain and see what we can find. I was like, sweet, let's do it. And I looked at the boys and they were both nodding like, yeah, we're fine. So they had all day. So it wasn't like a, a fear that they're going to not make it back by dark or something like that. And they were uh, both strapped, ready for whatever might uh, mm-hmm. try to right. attack them. So we, Matt and I take off and it's really interesting because as you're going up the side of these mountains, there is, it's, uh, you know, the face of the mountain is at such a steep angle that you're, you could reach your hand out and touch it. So you're just kind of doing these little slow zigzags up the side of the mountain. And then when you get to the top, it's like a knob that's rolling. And so then it's just like, la da da You know, you're right, just kind right. of cruising yeah. along the top. And uh, there's, there's literally no um, pain in that walking. It's just simple. Uh, there's nothing to trip over up there. It was just it was sweet. And the wind coming off of uh, the ocean is intense and it's cold. But aside from that, I mean, it's just gorgeous. As far as the eye can see, you're looking out over the lagoons and the harbors and all the mountain ranges. And uh, as we're walking along, um, I'm fixated on these, this herd of caribou to the left of the mountain. And, uh, Matt and I are discussing whether there's a big enough caribou bowl in there for us to take. And, and we both kind of decide there's not, well, while I'm watching these caribou, cause you know, when have I ever stared at caribou, uh, in the wild, he wow. finds a big black tailed deer and he's like, Adam, I think this is a black tailed deer we need to go after. So we study it for a little bit. We have pull out our little mountain house meals and jet boil and, have some food because we're depleted energy wise pretty good and then we start down this this other mountainside and both of us are um conscientious of safety pieces but at the same time like the thrill of that pursuit is uh just massively engaging and so the thought of like well we really need to plan out the timing of the rest of the day do we have time to really Mm -hmm. kill this and do this and uh not a whole lot of thought went into that um and so we get down to about 250 yards, take the animal, um, go down. And it was, it was so steep that, uh, as I'm, uh, quartering this animal, um, I'm bracing him with my knees and to keep him from rolling on down the rest of the, the side of the mountain. Oh, so he's like pitched on the side of the, yep. okay, got it. And he, he'd rolled into an alder thicket and that's what had kept him from rolling the rest of the way down the hill. And so, um. We get it all quartered up, put on our backs, and as we start out of there, we're carrying, um, you know, our packs were probably 40 pounds going down, and then on the way back out, we're at probably it's like 90 to 100 pounds each, and so we're climbing up that steep face, and Matt and I look at each other, and we're like, um, we should diagonal across this face. That'll save us a bunch of time instead of going all the way back up to the peak and doing this, so... 
instead of going up, we decide we're going right. to diagonal across. And we get about uh, a quarter away across and we start walking into this shale rock. And the whole slope was pretty gradually, I mean, it was very steep, but it was just steep, gradual, all the way down to the valley. But in this spot where the shale was, it was steep down to about a thousand feet and then just straight sheer drop off. So there's a cliff. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and so, shale is like loose. I mean, it's not gravel. It's like right. flat gravel. Yep. And it's just, um, you know, football size pieces to some little larger, some little smaller, softball all loose. size, all loose. This is the mountain eroding into yep. the, you know, Absolutely. fighting gravity. Yep. So the first few uh, hundred feet as you're walking, you're like, okay, this isn't super safe, but you're just kind of like, uh, framing your feet in and, and really digging in with each step. And then you take your next step and, uh, we have trekking poles. And so I'm kind of balancing with all of that. And, and you're really unaware of, uh, how much that extra weight on your back is mm. playing into what normally would just be you kind of agile angling across the face. Um, all of a sudden every step I'm sliding and I'm, I'm sliding two to three feet. And you're just kind of waiting for it to stop and then you take your next steps. And I'm uh, watching Matt in front of me and I'm saying, Matt, like, dude, I got a, at this point, Graylin is at home and he is a little over two months old is all. You got four and, kids, you're young as all. Yeah. And so I'm like, all this stuff starts to really play heavy on my heart and my mind. And uh, like you always talk about, it's happening between the years. Yeah. Um, so I, I become paralyzed with fear. Like- not so much of fear of, oh no, I might fall, but fear of, is this, am I going to die? Is this child going to be fatherless? Um, you know, I'm up here killing animals again, and <laughs> this is how they're going to lose their dad. Like just those, those processes, thoughts and rage being alone and all that's in my brain. And there was a, a wild, re not revelation, but re realization of how uh, what dependency on God actually looks like hmm. because it got to where I'm genuinely crying out out loud, God, give me direction. God, help me in this step. You're stuck. I'm stuck. I'm in a spot where, and now as I tell the story, I always uh, give pause from the perspective of people that are, there are people that experience sickness and hurts and trauma and family tragedy right. that I don't, I don't want even want act You're like I'm identifying that. Yeah. Yeah. But for, but for you, for me in that moment, that was a, other than, uh, a, a miscarriage and a lot of times getting up to preach, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a dependency of just, I can't do this. Um, but the, uh, in that space, there was a, a literal for an hour, 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, every step, God, give me direction. God, guard my steps. God, protect me. God, would you... And as we came through this, um, we got to the other side of this shale stuff. You're both praying out loud. Oh, yeah. 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 And Matt's a, uh, um, such a cool story how I met Matt. Um, I was wearing my ostrich leather boots at a wild game dinner and he had same, almost the same boots on. That's how we met. <laughs> and now we've been all over the country hunting yeah. and stuff together. But, um, but he's just steady as you go. He has a plan. Everything's good. Um, doesn't fret, doesn't like panic. Um, you could be on day eight of a hunt, nobody's seen or killed anything. And he's still like, all right, we're going to get him today kind of guy. And, uh, we get along great because of that. It's like no quit in us, but in that space, both of us are just, um, I think he's recognizing the, the weakness that we're both facing in that moment. He'd tweaked his knee at some point in there as well. And, uh, we get, get through it. And I just sat down and he goes, you're going to use that as a sermon illustration, aren't you? And I'm like, you better believe it, <laughs> you buddy. You better believe it. Hey, <laughs> so, I can't promise I won't use it. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be there, though. <laughs> yeah, but we uh, we ended up um, deciding uh, wisely at that moment to just finish the rest of the yeah. trek up to the top of the hill, get back to what we knew we would experience uh, or uh, the terrain that we had already experienced earlier in the day. Hmm. We were familiar with it. wasn't great. There was a giant suck factor to it, yeah. but at the, uh, uh, there weren't going to be any surprises. And we came over the top of the, uh, the ridge and there's a little crevice kind of cut out that shielded us from the wind. I have this, uh, packable 
down jacket on and I, I slide that on, sit back, uh, pull out blueberry crumble was the mountain house meal. <laughs> and uh, we both, it was kind of like a celebratory little dessert. We and, survived. Yeah, <laughs> made a cup of coffee sitting up there on the top of the hill and or on top of the mountain. And we, we were looking over uh, uh, a bay. Um, I think it was Halibut Bay maybe. And uh, I have a picture of that moment. He took a picture of me sitting there because it was just like I was in awe. Mm. But there was a... A different reflection yeah. on life in that Absolutely. space and uh, a joy. You know, I wanted to get back. I wanted to tell the boys the stories. Um, I wanted to see them. There yeah. was an interesting piece to that too. And um, why is dad hugging me? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? You're just gone all day. Yeah. <laughs> um, on that last little trek uh, from the top of that ridge back to base or to our spike camp, um, about three, 400 yards from camp. I pull up the binoculars to check and see if the boys are at camp. And they're both sitting on this little knob next to the tents with the spotting scope and glasses. And Kenton's got his rifle on the bipod aimed somewhat in our direction. And he's down on it. Like, you know, you'd think of somebody providing overwatch. He's, mm -hmm. he's doing this. And so I just stopped and I said, Matt, there's a bear. And he's like, where, where, where's the bear? And I'm like, no, there's a bear. Kenton's literally sitting on his rifle aimed in our direction. And Matt's like, okay. So we sneak up on, out of this, we were getting down in some alders again. So we get back a little bit higher on the ground and walk back and uh, boys come running and meet us at like 100 yards out. And Ken's like, dad, it was the biggest, most silver backed looking grizzly we've ever seen. Dang. And he's just telling me this whole story. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in those, that space, provided for me a perspective of, you know, a lot of times we, um, we control what we can control. We love control. Mm -hmm. um, we purposefully put ourselves in position to be in control, at least we think. Um, I have the way that I want to protect my family. I have a way I want to protect my kids. When you crawl into uh, a little um, two-man pup tent or whatever you want to call it, hub tent. And you zip that flap and you know that for the entirety of that night that you're sleeping, anything can have its way, <laughs> you know, right. like yeah. come at you. They smell you, they're coming. Uh, there's just a difference in um, the vulnerability, mm -hmm. but in that vulnerability, there was a dependency that I, uh, I came back from that trip to say, man, I, I just want to, I want to have that level of dependency on God and, you know, truly relish that feeling of God, I'm nothing and you are everything. Would you work through me in whatever endeavor it is? Mm. Um, that was such a valuable fear lesson that turned to a God That's providing you know, protection You know, when lessons. you mentioned that your hunting partner who is steady, who's a rock and you look up and you see him rattled, right? Yep. That's tough. It is. That's tough. But, you know, isn't it, isn't it wonderful that that the one that we really depend on, yeah, he never gets rattled. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what we have to, that's what gets you through those, those lost times, those scared times. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can get your mind focused back on what you know to be true, right. and what is the absolute and not let your mind take you to places that, that aren't real, Yeah, you know, not let your mind get the best of you. That's sure. how you, that's how you navigate those things. Mm -hmm. But the, it's good. also, you know, I'm just, um, I'm, I don't mean this in a weird way. Uh, I'm just talking real. This is how we do on the, at the tab, I guess. Um, there's a, there's a, not a jealousy because jealousy is, um, is sin, but there's, there's a, and so is envy, but there's something that you and your friend Matt shared. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect. You shared that moment. It was shared fear, shared dependency. You're having a little prayer service service. No one can ever take that away. For sure. And it's an intimacy that men shy away from that I wonder sometimes it's, is why men go to the wild, why they go to deer yeah. camp, they share those things no together. Question. That I can imagine. I, I mean, I've had that with other godly men in different situations, but that's something no one can ever take away from yeah. you guys. And the dependency wasn't just on God, at least in my mind's eye, uh, your son, like how proud were you? Your son had, like how old is he at this time? Uh, this is just two years ago. He's 18. So your 18-year-old son 
has got his dad's back. Yep. Like he wasn't goofing off. He wasn't on his phone. He's not trying to text his girlfriend. Yep. You know, he's like, dad's coming and we need to have, you know, eyes on. But then just that nonverbal communication, you trained him up and then there he is. Yep. And, and, and he's on overwatch, yep. uh, ready to, you know, drop a, was it a grizzly? Oh, he yeah. said, yeah, yep. yeah. Because they have brown bears up there too, right? Yeah. Same, same bear. Um, oh, it is the same on bear. the, yeah, on the, on Kodiak there, the brown bear, which is a little bit bigger, but the grizzly and the brown bears are the same bear. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. But dang, that's a close call. Twice. Same thing. I'm still trying to get over, over the fact that you hiked an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, look, <laughs> look, man, I did a lot of stuff yeah. on the soccer field, a, a, a lot of terrain, and, but not carrying a, you know, 60 pound pack and, and your rifle, right? Yeah. Cause you got, or that wasn't bow that time, right? We, we carried our bows. That was our intent was to kill everything with our tree and uh that's uh next trip we're gonna that uh, will be more devoted to that one thing i've learned is that if you truly desire to shoot them with your bow don't have a buddy with a rifle next to you because uh when you're hiking down and all that work that it takes to get close enough to shoot them with a bow and then you're like but i could just you know and i'm here <laughs> you, you grab the rifle and kill them pretty quickly so yeah but you have another firearm though too right just uh, for protection? Yeah, I was carrying a, a 10 millimeter Glock okay, as well. Yeah. I have friends that hunted out in Colorado and wanted to borrow a handgun I may or may not own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it was, yeah, it was for the same thing. And I and it never even occurred to me, but it's like, oh yeah. Yeah. A lot um, of the guides carry flare guns. So the boys were carrying flare guns. Um, Matt, my buddy had a flare gun and then he always had the rifle strapped on his shoulder too, so... Is the flare gun if the preacher gets lost? No, just literally shooting it at a bear. Really? Yeah. The They all said that the uh, reaction of the bear to that was almost immediate, As whereas with a firearm, sometimes they just keep, oh. keep coming. See, I'm learning stuff even yeah. right now. So, so fear's a big deal. Yeah. So talk about the, um, for either one of you. Hey, Benji, we good on time? Okay. Uh Hey, first of all, we need to do this again. Yeah, let's do it. 100%. Because I, we haven't even scratched the surface. You got more on there. I know that right now <laughs> that computer is running. It's just once you see the path, you see it everywhere. But I'm wondering if we can talk about the, um, the communal aspect. Like, is there anything that just kind of comes to your mind where you saw um, what wasn't there? I'm talking about the relationship between you know, someone that you took, someone that was with you, like, have you ever seen that in a, in a powerful way? So hunting is not one of the things that I've learned. It's not just about me alone in the pursuit of a fish or the pursuit of an animal. Uh, Matt, I've watched you use your boat <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't do this to you. We did it in a different way, but we've, we've brought on staff before where it's like, uh, Hey, do you like to fish? Yeah. Okay. You're going to go uh, fish with Matt. And the whole thing it's like he's out of his element. He's driving a boat. I may or may not be talking about a former youth pastor, but um, just just from the communal relationship building thing, have you ever seen that in a profound way? Because that's not natural for men. Right. Uh, I, I heard a guy one time say that men normally, short of the grace of God or the, the work of the Holy Spirit, usually aren't able to just talk like this mm -hmm. in a deep way about what's going on in their heart. Yeah. Where men are much better at shoulder to shoulder looking at another thing first, mm -hmm. and I wonder if if you know is there anything like that that kind of comes to your mind? Absolutely. Well, I've had a, a lot of those experiences over the latter part of my life in, in hunting camps and in, in a fishing boat, where you've actually had time to to get real uh, with a brother. And I think, like your story points out, that's why we do it. A lot of times, it does put us in those situations where. Uh, you're you're a bit on the edge, and you can get real. But in my in my life, um, I mentioned that that I had walked away for a, yeah. for a good period of time. Um, but God used, uh, I believe, my fishing uh, almost addiction to bring me back. Um, when I onboarded uh, with the Tabernacle 15 years ago or so, um, I had been fishing a tournament. It, uh, on the Manistee River, and we had actually we had won that tournament the year before. So I mean, that wasn't something I was going to miss, and all my friends knew it. 
and there just happened to be a uh, an event here, a weekend event, a ministry event that uh, was a gut check for me at the time. I, I I just started to start walking a little closer. Just little baby uh, steps. Little back, baby yep. steps coming, and then um, this event came along, and it was on the weekend of my fishing tournament. <laughs> <laughs> so it, for me, that was gut check time. I had to decide whether I was going to continue to put what I wanted to do first, mm-hmm. or if I was actually going to take some, a selfish piece of myself and give it up and do something I knew to be more beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that was just the most powerful weekend of my life. I mean, um, somebody brought I, in a speaker. Yeah. There was a, there was a guy out of Indiana. I don't remember. Oh, Darren. Yeah. Darren, yeah. yeah, powerful, yeah, powerful. I could have very easily decided, no, I want to go fishing because I did want to go fishing. Was that to do yeah. Saturday <laughs> and Sunday? On, the, idea on February the twenty eighth of all the, days. Well, we were thinking deer season's over. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just so happy that God um, used Darren and used the tabernacle. I forgot about that. And and I made a choice that was a good choice for a change, and I put something ahead of what, what I wanted to do inside. And I think for me, it's, it's a continuation of, you know, you're not number one, <clears throat> you're not number one. And every time I make a choice that puts myself in the proper order, you know, it's, it's God and it's others and you, and if we can live in that space, we're pretty happy people. Yeah. And good. the, and the, and the cool thing is, is God, God's not against fishing. No, and not he's at not all. against a fishing not, tournament. He's not against us enjoying the outdoors. Not at but all. But it is a priority thing. Mm-hmm. But you have it to, does become a priority thing. And if we can use it uh, to His glory, then we can do all of it we want, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I've and and I've watched you over and over and over. It's been with me. It's been with other Christian guys to encourage. But I've watched you take friends that aren't necessarily walking with the Lord, and Hey, we're gonna go on this hunt for the for the reason that I'm talking about mm. is is it's gonna be another Gerhard moment yeah. someplace, and you're not at the campfire hitting a guy over the head with a Bible, but it's about building that relationship. And I think that's purposeful in in Dean Haltz's ministry in the UP. That's and, right, and in, and in Adam's current ministry that uh, we go hunting, we have a good time. We we. Try not to keep it a closed camp, right? Yeah. And open up the camp. Yeah. So that uh, others can see that, hey, you know what? You can have a great time. You can have the best time of your life. Yeah. When things are in order. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the sports context, even uh, teams are forged and formed in hardship and hard times. You know, you got a, a football camp that's a two a day. And yeah. it's brutal and you're just, Embrace the guys are, the suck. <laughs> yeah. And they're just yeah. beat down. Shared and, suffering. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the spaces that deep, um, lifelong friendships are forged and, um, even, uh, ministry friendships are forged has been in hardships, mm. uh, whether it's hardships in ministry or, uh, in the wild, um, some of the closeness that I, uh, just am so incredibly thankful to get to share with my boys is not just in um, one with Addie too. You know, it's not just in uh, all these little joyous things that we do together. It's the uh, brutality of building a home together. It's the uh, hunts that are awful. Um, It's the trips across the bay to fish and um, storms blow and you're out there just beating waves coming back and, and everybody's kind (laughs) of, looking cautiously at each other like are we are we gonna get back and uh, when i stop the boat and tell everybody to button up the life jackets and batten down the hatches then the things get real but in those moments there's a a, a bond that's forged that's just a, a brotherhood that's different than just doing easy things i think even the culture of hunting has changed enough that uh we miss that to a degree you know mm-hmm. you think of the old time deer camps where guys oh, are just wow. doing hard things um, now it's, uh, we live pretty posh lives in, in oh, those yeah. spaces. Um, but still that, that, uh, bond that's built in those spaces is just different. Um, it's, uh, you know, and then when you share the brotherhood of 
of being a child of God and wanting to challenge and polish each other in that iron sharpens iron perspective. Um, you, you leave those camps just energized and recharged and, uh, we're, we're doing a trip here in a couple of weeks. Um, oh, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. asking, uh, God to, uh, do some great work there and even the uh, snow goose. Yeah. Snow geese. Yeah. Arkansas. Snow geese, snow goose. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So a couple guys going on there, a couple guys that may or may not have faith. Yeah. And, uh, just a chance to point them to Jesus. Some guys that do that need, a. A uh, little firebrand to the backside and, and yeah. uh, get back on track. So um thankful for. I am jealous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but someday. Yeah. Or sometime. Just got a budget for it. Yeah. But that's awesome. And, you know, in fact, I, w- I was thinking about this. Um, we do have to do another one. Um, so we'll call this Hunting Stories Part 1. Right. Uh, but uh, in, in fact, it could be an ongoing installment because- I know both of you have more stories and I know there's men and women that have stories and it's a huge part of Northern Michigan culture. Yeah. Um, at some point I'll tell you a story about a turkey. The first time I shot a turkey, oh man, I learned I so much about me and sin and, and decoys and yeah, we'll, I'll save it. But um, uh, yeah, thanks for being on here today. Yeah, it's good, man. Both of you, you got more. I only touched two of the eight that I have on my oh, list. Oh, so, yeah. We're yeah, going to just, good. maybe we'll spin it around and you'll host the stories. Yeah, it's good. like, just let me ask the questions after you tell the story. Good idea. Yeah, that would be cool. But I want to get on the Manistee with you uh, before my brother-in-law and niece come up. Okay. And, but we got to get that motor fixed. Yeah, that'll, that'll take what care of What kind of motor itself. is it? It's a it's a 90 horse jet pump motor that's just wore out. It's a 2008 motor that's been abused for 14, 15 years have been run, 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 run. So it was time for it to, to know. Oh, so you're anything. looking for a new one? Yeah. I'm getting a new one put on. So what kind? Same thing. What's the motor? I need, to, I need to get another 14 What's a brand years. Name? That'll get me out there to about 80 and maybe I'll slow down by then. But it, is it an Evinrude? It's a Yamaha. Yamaha, no free shout outs. So, yeah. you know, if you want to go to heaven, river. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want to just, if you, you know, just wants, wants to drop off the truck here. No, so. I'd love, I hope it works out that we can get out here pretty quick. The fishing is great right now. So you don't have any stories, but you have shot the white tailed deer. Hey, we'll take Benji yeah. with us when we go. Benji's big thing is he's, he's now after one with a bow and I'm, and I couldn't be more proud. So That's he's, good. he's going for one with a bow and, but you hear that 10 reps a day is what the expert said. Yeah. But if you do a hundred a day, you might still miss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you might the, still the idea of the 10 a day is that each shot is a, is the shot that counts. So as you draw your bow, that's before you release that arrow, that's the animal and you're sizing that up in your mind and not just taking practice shots with the belief of, oh, that was a bad shot. I'll, I'll make a better one the next one. So it's like 10 purposeful, intentional, like your yep. life depended on it yep. shots. Exactly. Yeah. It's good. Well, that was good. Well, uh, Lord, we thank you for the great outdoors. Yeah, and I thank you gentlemen for taking the time to be with absolutely. us and tab family. Uh, if, uh, you know, someone who loves hunting, uh, share this with them. Um, if, uh, our former, uh, youth pastor was here, he'd say, like it, uh, subscribe to the podcast unsubscribe, then subscribe again because <laughs> algorithms are real, or at least they used to be. I don't know if that still works. I Our executive producer, are. Matt's not here. Yeah. You don't think it does? It, yeah. So they've changed the algorithms? I mean, that's just not how it works. It's <laughs> not how it looks. <laughs> I'm just going with what they told the boomer here. So, yeah. but like it and share it, like it, share it and subscribe on all the platforms. Yeah, Boom. that's cool. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, until next time, Tab family, this is Matt Adam, Benjamin, and myself signing off.